Uh, for those of you that joined us a little late, uh, welcome. This is uh, track five, uh, nano devices and nano sensors. I'm the session chair. I'm joined by Shumei Wang, who's session co-chair. I think in the interest of time, I'll just introduce myself. And uh, I'm the second speaker. And today I'm going to be talking about the functionalization of diatom nanostructures for device applications. Uh, my co-authors on this work are two of my recently graduated uh, PhD students I'm very proud of. One is Clayton Jeffries. Uh, he's now uh, assistant professor at Catholic University in Belgium. And second uh, is uh, Debbie Gale, and she's a research scientist with uh, Life Technologies. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the research to the National Science Foundation and through the Oregon Nanoscience and Electro Technology Institute. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, microorganisms which actually produce uh, semiconductor uh, nanomaterials. And the specific sort of organism that we work with is called a diatom, and it's a photosynthetic uh, algae that possesses a uh, micro scale silica based shell. So here's a picture of the living organism right here. The green material is the uh, chlorophyll contained in the chloroplast within the organism. And when you see this outside feature here, it's actually composed of glass, so it's transparent under a light microscope. But if you just remove those cellular materials, you expose this uh, intricate nanostructure. And it's hierarchical. If you look at um, the structure at increasingly higher uh, uh, magnifications, you see at the submicron scale this very uh, ordered lattice that resembles a photonic crystal array. And actually embedded within this submicron core array is a series of fine structures and even finer nanostructures here embedded with them at scale features uh, below um, 10 nanometers. Uh, in addition to the lipsoidal organism I just showed you, they also have um, uh, centric <coughs> shaped organisms with a radial symmetry. And one feature all of these organisms possess is that they have actually two shells, an upper shell and a lower shell, and then all of the uh, cellular material is contained within them. So about the past 10 years in my laboratory, we've been exploding these organisms for uh, nanotechnology applications. And we do this through a three-step process that involves bioprocess, or a four-step process that involves bioprocess engineering, material science, and device fabrication. So since the organism is essentially doing all the biofabrication work, the first thing that we do is develop systems to basically uh, cultivate identical uh, uh, micro devices, if you will, on a mass scale through bioreactor cultivation. Once we have that material in hand, then we actually develop a thin film from this material through a variety of techniques, which I won't um, go here. And then once we have this thin film, then we can functionalize it either with biological molecules or with additional um, semiconductor nanophases. And then finally, we take this uh, functionalized uh, uh, diatom-based uh, thin film, and we actually make devices out of it. And the three advice devices that we've uh, considered to date um, include a diatom-based immunocomplex biosensor, a diatom uh, germanium oxide doped uh, electroluminescent emitter, and a diatom um, titanium dioxide-based uh, disensitized solar cell. And today I'm going to be talking about, about two of these applications. The the biosensor and the electroluminescent emitter. In terms of platform level technology, uh, we have two basic approaches. The first is a biological insertion of uh, metal oxides into the semiconductor nanophases, actually while the cell is living. And then in the second approach, we uh, take the isolated uh, diatom biosilica and we actually chemically or biologically functionalize it with um, additional moieties to impart a, a unique function and properties to the material. So I'm just going to start by overviewing the biological approach. Um, 
using an example of uh, germanium oxide biologically doped semiconductor material that serves as an electroluminescent um, emitter. So this is where the biology part comes in. If you look here, here's the cell suspension culture of those microscale organisms I showed you either earlier. And about one cubic centimeter contains over a million of these. They're identical. Uh, we use a, a externally illuminated bioreactor to cultivate these organisms because their photosynthesis requires light as an energy source and actually carbon dioxide as a carbon source. But since they have uh, inorganic based shells, we also do a program feeding of dissolved silicon and dissolved germanium by these organisms. And these organisms take up these uh, precursors in the soluble state and then fabricate uh, uh, nanostructure materials from them. So briefly, uh, if the organism is in a state where it's about ready to divide, Normally in the center, there's just the cytoplasmic materials. But when the cell is ready to divide, it forms a plane of cell division. And on either side of the pl plane of cell division, it sets up an organelle that uh, orchestrates the fabrication of the nanostructured metal oxide phase. So this organism can do it against the concentration gradient. It has a uh, uh, silica transporter built into the cell membrane, which essentially pumps in the soluble silicon, or in our case, we also feed it a uh, foreign substrate, um, soluble germanium. This material is then polymerized into nanoparticles based on an organic template phase within this uh, deposition vesicle. And then this allows you to impart um, foreign metal oxide uh, nanophases embedded within the silica matrix. <coughs> So we can control this process by, by determining when in the cell cycle the organism is most likely to take up a uh, foreign metal, and then controlling the uh, ratio of those two metals, and the total amount that we add to design a certain uh, composition and uh, production capacity for uh, making these nanophases. And in this particular experiment here, we added enough silicon so that the cells would undergo just one cell division. So shown here, um, the organism takes up silicon. That silicon is used um, to make a second shell for each side so that when the cell divides, a new shell is formed. If we add in germanium concurrently with this uh, silica that's being formed, we can actually make a silica germanium nanocomposite on one side of the organism. And we could design, like I said, the composition um, associated with that. Now, what we found is that when we uh, put this material into the diatom shell, we enable the photoluminescent property to the material. The actual native biosilica itself has some uh, level of photoluminescence due to the fact that it is a biogenic material. This biogenic material has silanol groups that uh, impart uh, some photoluminescence in the material. In our particular analysis, we just used a 337 uh, nanometer UV laser to excite uh, the material and then just looked at the um, uh, emission from that material. When we impart these uh, germanium oxide defects into the silicon nanostructure, we greatly increase the photoluminescence emission capacity of this material, and we also shift the uh, center of luminescence into the, into the blue range. So this gives you an uh, illustration of how we can grow up the organism and then control the, the composition of foreign metal oxides into it. In order to enable uh, this process for integration into devices, we want to put this ultimately onto a thin film and the way we do this is actually pretty simple. After we grow up the cells, we just put in, for example, conductive glass that you could use as a substrate for various uh, optoelectronic device fabrication. And the organisms will actually settle onto the glass and they'll move on the glass here. I don't have a movie to show you like the previous speaker. But uh, they'll actually move and self-assemble into a dense film. And then if you just take that dense film and use, for example, oxygen plasma treatment, you can basically uh, take off all the organic materials as carbon dioxide and leave behind 
the silica shells, in this case, on um, uh, an indium tin oxide conductive glass litter. And then in this uh, particular application here for looking at uh, electroluminescent um, capability, is that we simply use the atomic layer deposition to put on a hafnium um, silicate dielectric, then put on another aluminum uh, back electrode by physical vapor deposition, and then simply just charged up the device under AC current. So we built the um, emitter biologically, and then we integrated it into a device using pretty pretty basic, pretty standard um, semiconductor device fabrication technology. So here's an example of the type of uh, emission characteristics you can get from this. So if you just use the silica itself, um, you don't get any signal, but when you have the uh, germanium, biologically doped um, germanium diatoms in here, you get a pretty strong focused emission. Um, if you just look at it at the naked eye, it's kind of blue from uh, electroluminescence charging. But if you look at the full spectrum, you see some interesting things. The first thing that you see is you see, you see a series of uh, uh, near lasing uh, lines in the UV. And then complementary to, their, to those are the uh, um, two lambda resonance lines associated with those primary emissions. And I can't go into the details here, but we've done some other photonic uh, crystal calculations that based on the pitch of the pores and um, their lattice constant is that uh, these are uh, predicted, nominally predicted, outcoupled uh, wavelengths that you get um, as a result of this nanostructure. And that it's not perfect here since this is a biologically uh, produced organism. It's not producing um, uh, to... Um, a single lasing line, but it's showing about three primary ones here. So that's an example of, a, of one sort of device that we can make. The second one that I'll talk about is a uh, nano-enabled nano uh, biomolecule sensor that uses the diatom frustule as the um, sensing and reporting platform. So in uh, detection for um, antibody um, antigen binding, you have three steps. The first step, you want to challenge the sensor with a mixture containing the target molecule. And then the second step, you bind that target molecule to an antibody um, on the sensor. So in this case here, uh, here's your mixture with the circles and the diamonds given, and only the diamonds are recognized by the antibody. So it enables you to, to pick those out of the mixture, and then once you've got that accomplished, you have to report that. And this is where the difficulty comes in. Uh, LISA method is commonly used, but that's a labeling required method. Uh, you can use optical methods such as SARES, but that requires some um, complicated instrument that you have to have. Um, you can also do mass uh, measurement, for example, with a cantilever, or you can do electrical measurement. But all those require devi devices associated with them. What we wanted to have was a system for standoff uh, detection, and uh, the way we did that was using this native, uh, using this intrinsic property of photoluminescence associated with these materials that we can make. But before I show you that, first I just want to overview the chemistry of just how we got the uh, antibody onto the surface. Uh, unlike glass, uh, biogenic silica has a lot of silanol groups that come in it because it's an amorphous material. So it's readily functionalized, functionalized to have an amine um, uh, functionalized surface, in this case through amino trifocal silane. And then with those reactive amine centers, you can use a common uh, biomolecule uh, protein cross-linking agent. In this case, we used a BS3. That provides about a one nanometer linker, and then you can um, couple the antibody directly to it. In this case here, we used a rabbit uh, immunoglobin um, G antibody, just a model system. The picture here indicates that we get pretty uniform coverage of the amine groups to prep the system for functionalization. So, uh, schematically,